amazing, amazing, amazing. <laughs> welcome to Kid Ops Days, everybody. Um, welcome, Vanessa. My welcome, guys. <laughs> let's get into it. Let's start. Yes. We were messaging in Slack. It's like, oh, let's toss it. Music versus <laughs> tutorial. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, but let's get right into it. Um, we have two fantastic speakers. Um, the, um, sorry, Joaquin and Tiffany. Hello. Fresh, Hi guys! Fresh <laughs> off of um, KubeCon EU, where all three of you were there eating delicious foods and having a great time. And I loved, loved, loved seeing the tweet from the packed room um, from two of you from the stage, which was such an awesome, awesome pick. Um, and uh, yeah, I know you're, um, this is a tutorial that's been around for a while. Joaquin, your team has had it out on GitHub and uh, we're kind of making it available um, to people to try, and thanks to Microsoft and your team, you're actually providing environments. Uh, so why don't we just jump right into it? Because I know you'll explain, um, again, everybody needs to be in Slack to be able to get the information to join along. And we've got a full 90 minutes, after which we'll have another musical break and kick off the keynote. So um, take it away. Thanks so much, Tamal and you. Vanessa. And give me one second while I pull up my screen share. Um, that look okay to folks? Cool. <laughs> I'll assume that looks okay. Um, and thank you all so much for joining us. Um, and thank you so much to Get Up Stays for having us. Um, as Tama mentioned, um, Joaquin and I just uh, presented this hands-on tutorial at KubeCon EU. Um, and we're really excited to present this workshop at GitOps Days as well. In our session today, we're going to be covering an introduction to Kubernetes, GitOps, and observability. And before I get started on the materials, um, I'll invite Joaquin to give a little introduction to himself. Yeah, thank you, Tiffany. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Joaquin Rodriguez. I work for Microsoft as a senior software engineer. I'm happy to be here uh, as part of Microsoft. I do all things Kubernetes uh, with customers and help them onboard them, you know, to use cloud native uh, technologies. So uh, I'm, like I said, really happy to be here and, you know, to share this awesome tutorial with you all. Thanks, Joaquin. Um, and I'm Tiffany Wayne. I'm a solutions architect on the customer success team at Leafworks. And like Joaquin, I work with customers to adopt cloud native uh, technologies and architecture, and also streamline operations and deployments to Kubernetes clusters, both on premise and in public cloud with GitOps at scale. Um, so um, to get some housekeeping um, accomplished at the beginning of this session, um, if you would like to uh, follow along and uh, participate in today's workshop, you're going to need to register for the hands-on tutorial. And um, Kingdon hopefully has uh, dropped in the registration link, which is https cube101.dev, um, as well as the username and password that you'll need to supply. Following that, you can register with your GitHub username. Um, and you should get an email invitation to the Kubernetes 101 GitHub org. In this org, there are two repositories, but for today's workshop, we're going to be using the GitOps Days repository. And that's where we're going to be creating our GitHub code spaces um, to conduct the workshop. So um, I'm going to be navigating away from this slide, um, but um, you will certainly have some time to uh, uh, finish up your registration um, and the format of today's um, uh, workshop is going to be um, some introductory slides covering the topics before we move on to the hands-on portion of this tutorial. So I'll continue on um, with an introduction to Kubernetes. And I'll, um, I'm guessing that this will be um, information that you're already familiar with, but just to start from the beginning, Kubernetes is an open source cloud native computing foundation graduated project um, created at Google now maintained by CNCF for container orchestration. 
Kubernetes allows you to define declarative configuration to manage your containerized workloads and services. And Kubernetes is cloud native. It's highly distributed, allows for frequent releases, and also guards you um, and provides resiliency to failure in infrastructure failures and changes. Kubernetes provides automation and observability, self-healing and horizontal scaling, and service discovery and load balancing. Kubernetes is scalable and can run on-premise in the in public cloud and a mix of both. So you can have a similar deployment experience regardless of your cloud provider. There are a few components in this diagram, but it provides an overview um, as to how Kubernetes clusters work. And on the left-hand side, you'll see control plane components. These components typically run in control plane nodes and are responsible for managing the scheduling and creation of workloads to be run on worker nodes. The control plane components include the API server, uh, which allows users to interact with the Kubernetes API, and it also validates and configures data for Q Kubernetes objects. We also have the controller manager, which encapsulates processes for nodes, jobs, endpoints, and many others. We have etcd, which is the backing store for the cluster state. We have the scheduler, which determines where workloads will run within the cluster. And we also have an optional cloud controller manager to handle any cloud provider specific logic. Now, these worker nodes are where your workloads will typically get scheduled. And some key components of these nodes include the kubelet, which manages containers created by Kubernetes, and it ensures that they run in pods and come up successfully, as well as the kube proxy, which manages network rules on your nodes for internal and external communications for your cluster. We're going to spend some time focusing on the Kube, Kube API server to understand how Kubernetes resources are grouped and managed. There are a lot of Kubernetes resources and they're grouped by their primary functions. As an example, there is an API group dedicated to uh, to role-based access control, scheduling, admission registration, auto-scaling, and many more. But in today's workshop, we're going to uh, be mostly working with core API group objects, that is resources in the core and apps API groups. These include namespaces, deployments, services, and secrets. And the API server allows us to create, read, update, and delete these resources. You can also extend the Kubernetes API by creating controllers that interact with custom resource definitions. And in a few slides, uh, we'll go into more depth about uh, Flux, which is one such example. It's really important to understand that Kubernetes resources are all declaratively defined using YAML. The declarative definitions of these resources helps to simplify some complex processes that happen within the cluster. So we've got a whole bunch of resources, but how do they work together to ultimately express an application that serves your traffic? This slide highlights some of the resources that we're going to be using today, and we can actually start from the um, innermost part, which is the container. A container runs an image, which is an immutable copy of your application code along with its dependencies, um, and containers run within pods. Pods, then, are the smallest deployable unit in Kubernetes, and it is assigned an IP, is ephemeral, and you can add metadata like labels to it. And you can have multiple containers that run um, within a pod. Containers within a pod share the same network namespace. Now, while you can deploy pods by themselves, it's recommended that you instead use deployments, or if you have stateful workloads, stateful sets, um, and deployments allow you to specify the number of replicas that you want to run 
as well as the deployment strategy of those replicas. So you can imagine if you have a deployment um, that specifies n number of pods and replicas that you want to be run, each with their own IP, you can define a service that maps to the, the deployment. The service then gets a virtual IP and is named in DNS, and the service and the deployment both are deployed to a namespace, which itself is a Kubernetes resource. And Kubernetes namespaces provides logical boundaries for your resources to be grouped in. Kubernetes does a lot of the heavy lifting when it comes to creating your resources and scheduling them, um, but there are a lot of resources to define and manage, and we need a way to reproduce and easily see what resources um, comprise your desired state and what has been deployed, and GitOps solves this very neatly. The Open GitOps Working Group maintains these GitOps principles, and it's an open group. So if you're interested in joining, um, like to extend the invitation, um, and GitOps builds on DevOps and infrastructure as code, and it's a natural extension to Kubernetes. And by adhering to these principles on this slide, you can empower developers by increasing productivity, improving stability and reliability, and enforcing consistency and security. GitOps requires then that one, your entire system's desired state is defined declaratively. Two, your desired state is versioned and immutable. Git lends itself really well to this and also allows developers to stay in the workflows that they know best and that they use every day. But today, other version control systems are also supported. Three, Software agents like Flux automatically pull from the desired state store. And four, software agents continuously reconcile the running system state against the desired state. So if, when we're thinking about what a GitOps workflow looks like, and if you're interested in adopting GitOps, um, you might think, gosh, does this mean we have to start from square one? And the answer is no. <laughs> On the left-hand side, you'll see a continuous integration workflow that begins with developers writing application code, subsequently building and testing that code, and it should culminate in the publishing of an immutable artifact. Um, can be an image, can be a Helm chart, etc. On the right is the GitOps workflow, which is still centered around Git, but this time it's focused on the management of your declaratively defined resources to be deployed to your Kubernetes cluster. And it helps to streamline your observability efforts and simplifies the operations required to manage your cluster. If you treat Git as the single source of truth that defines what your system should look like, any changes that you make to your cluster should be submitted via pull request. And this allows you to easily see the difference between your running and desired state. And with software agents like Flux, the two should be automatically reconciled. This gives you an inherent audit trail of who made what changes, when, and why. Um, and if something goes wrong after a change, you can easily roll back to last known good state with a fix forward commit or a revert. Weaverks actually coined the term GitOps to describe the process that the team followed to accomplish a mean time to recovery of approximately 45 minutes after a production outage. And they did this almost 10 years ago now. And while tooling today now supports means other than Git, as I mentioned previously, that's where the term comes from. So GitOps then is the practice of using Git to store declaratively defined desired state with continue continuous delivery agents like Flux to automate the reconciliation of your observed state to desired state and GitOps effectively decouples CI from CD. GitOps is itself is agnostic to tooling, but for today's workshop, we're going to be using Flux. Now, Flux is an open source CNCF project created at Waveworks, 
and its runtime is composed of a set of Kubernetes controllers along with their corresponding custom resource definitions. In today's workshop, we're going to be focusing on the source controller and the customized controller. The Flux source controller interacts with custom resources such as Git repositories, Helm repositories, Helm charts, and buckets, and we're going to be using Git repositories today. Git repositories are how Flux knows which repository and the branch within that repository to monitor, and you can do some sophisticated things, like also ignore certain files that you don't want Flux to monitor. We're also going to be using the customized controller. Now, the customized controller is one of Flux's reconciler controllers, and it interacts with a customization CRD. The Flux customization allows Flux to know the path within the specified source, in our case for today, a Git repository, um, from which Flux should reconcile, uh, read from and reconcile the resources included in that specific path. Um, as its name implies, um, you can certainly use uh, Customize, which is a configuration, customization with a C, uh, tool that has been native to Kubernetes as of 1.14. Um, the Customize controller also interacts with plain Kubernetes manifests. Um, and in the box below, you can see um, a, an example of the resources that the Customize controller can reconcile. But effectively, it can reconcile all Kubernetes manifests. Flux keeps your Kubernetes cluster in sync with the source of configuration that holds your desired state and automatically and continuously reconciles the two. So now we have a Kubernetes cluster. We have Kubernetes that allows us to declaratively define the resources that comprise our applications and GitOps to streamline the operations by which those resources are deployed to the cluster. We need a way to easily understand the goings on of the cluster, and we can look to observability to solve this. Monitoring and observability go hand in hand, where observability is arguably the superset, and observability allows you to inspect, observe, trace, and write custom queries to understand how your system is performing. And with monitoring, the metrics, alerts, dash, dashboards, and queries that you set up need to be actionable. There are many tools available to accomplish metrics, data visualization, and logging, and still more components of an observability stack, including tracing. But in today's workshop, we're going to be using Prometheus for metrics collection. And Prometheus is an open source CNCF project created by SoundCloud for monitoring and alerting, and it stores metrics as time series data. We're also going to be using Grafana for dashboards to display our metrics. And Grafana is created by Grafana Labs, and it's an open source tool that easily allows you to visualize and understand your metrics. And we'll be using Fluentbit for logs and met metrics processing and forwarding. And Fluentbit is an open source CNCF project under the FluentD umbrella created by Treasure Data, and it's um, a high performance option with a significantly lighter footprint, footprint than FluentD. And we're going to be deploying the observability stack with Flux and fo um, by following GitOps principles. So now that we've covered Kubernetes, GitOps, and observability, let's dive into the hands on tutorial and see it all in action. And I'm going to stop my share now and hand over to Joaquin to get us started. Thank you, Tiffany. Let me share my screen really quick. Okay, so, oh, give me one second. Sorry about that. Yeah, I don't know what the, Okay, here you go. Okay, 
So uh, by now you should, um, like Tiffany mentioned, uh, you should you know, in order to access this uh, tutorial, you need to register uh, to this org. Reason being is uh, just by registering to this org, you will have access to code spaces. Uh, for this workshop, we'll be using code spaces as the platform to develop and deploy things. Uh, we'll be using a uh, K3D cluster. So um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them on Slack. Uh, I believe there have been already posted like the credentials and how to, how to do the registration. Um, so let's get started. Uh, the first thing that you will want to do uh, once you reach these, uh, this repo, you're going to see a green button here that says code. And once you click here, you will see that you can create a new uh, code space uh, using the main branch. So once you do that, Yes, thank you. Is that a little better? Okay. Okay, so what's happening now, um, we have already like a pre-built code space image that, you know, we have hosted. So essentially when you create a new code space, uh, it's, you know, code spaces is downloading this pre-built image that allows you to have um, a Kubernetes cluster ready set up for you as well as all of the you know tools uh, that will be using for deployment um, for all these like you know applications right so just like that uh, we, we already have um, this code space created oh and by the way uh, if you're not familiar with code spaces so essentially code space it's vs code uh, in the cloud um, essentially it's running on a vm and you know you have access to to this vm to do you know development and deployments etc um, so, okay, so the way we shaped this tutorial, uh, we meant it to be, you know, um, like, you know, hands-on and we essentially provided with all the instructions on how to do this, but we'll be walking you, you know, step-by-step -step on what is happening and we're going to be providing some explanation as well. So to get started, you're going to see a readme file. You're going to right click on it and you're going to click on open preview. Okay, let's do that. Is that a little better? Okay, let me see. I might make a movie like that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's try that. Thanks for letting me know. Okay, so just like that, you just when, when you know you start your uh, code space. Uh, just out of the bat, you already have a K3D cluster uh, available for you. If you're not familiar with K3D, so K3D is a lightweight single node Kubernetes cluster. Um, it's essentially K3S, but is running as a Docker container. So we have Docker running in this VM as well, and it's already uh, ready for you to use. You don't have to worry about setting it up or anything. So um, to verify that the cluster is up and running, you can start with this command kubectl get all uh, all namespaces and you can you know you can copy paste as well once you do a copy paste you're gonna get this pop-up that is actually you know if you're using chrome or edge uh, it's prompting you if you want to you know allow the clipboard to to um, paste your commands right so you can just click allow and once mm -hmm. you do that sorry you can see in. that sorry what was that Sorry, just jump in audio. I'm just monitoring Slack and noticing some people having an issue. Is this the time I should jump in to let you know, or will you take questions after you go through these instructions? Oh, okay. So if you don't see the code space, uh, like create with code space, mean, that means that you're not part of the org yet. So you're gonna have to register using uh, kube101.dev. And when, um, is going to prompt you for a username and password and then you're going to put your github username once you register you're going to get an invite from github and you make sure you click accept because even if you register and you don't accept you're not going to have access to to code spaces okay, that's great okay so as you can see now uh so we have a kubernetes cluster there's nothing well there's a few things that are deployed by default but we have no our custom applications deployed. So 
the the goal here um you know that we're going to walk you through first is we're going to walk you through deploying a custom application right um manually using uh kubectl apply and then we're going to do the same thing but using flux and you know that way you can see like the the benefits of using flux okay so now okay we have you know all the resources uh you can also list your um, namespaces by like using kubectl get pods dash a by the way dash a it's the same thing as all namespaces it's just a shortcut so these are the pods that are running um so so far we're you know we're pretty good one thing that i also want to note is that we're going to be using port forward as part of uh code spaces so by default we already have defined a few port forwards they're not um like they're active but we're not we don't have the applications running so like right now you can see we have some port forwards defined for Prometheus, for our custom app, for Grafana, etc. So I just wanted to know that really quick, um, you know, before we get started. Just, just, just know that this exists and we'll be using it throughout the uh, throughout the workshop. So, okay. So the first thing that you want to do uh, to deploy our app manually, you're gonna go into this uh, workshop manifest uh, directory. Here we have some uh, YAML that we'll be using to deploy our application. So what you want to do is uh, you, you want to go into CD workshop manifest and then IMDB. So IMDB is a custom application that, that we wrote. Essentially, uh, it's a .NET application uh, that it has been put in a container. And this app allows you to make different requests to an in-memory database to query different movies and actors from IMDb. So in order to get started, the first thing you want to do is uh, you want to create a, a namespace. So uh, on Kubernetes, everything it's uh, defined in namespaces. So to set up this application, you're going to need a namespace. So before I do the kubectl apply, I'm going to show you how this namespace YAML looks like. So if I open this, it's very straightforward. All you're saying is, hey, Kubernetes, I want you to create uh, a namespace and I want you to call it IMDB. Pretty straightforward. So to deploy that, all you do is just type kubectl apply dash f. It's uh, basically you're saying that it's a file and namespace. And you can see that you know this namespace was created. And if you way to verify that this namespace was created, you can do kubectl get ns. And you can see here that 11 seconds ago, um, a namespace called imdb got created. So now, if I want to deploy my application, I'm going to use a uh, deployment. Like uh, we stated here, uh, deployment provides a declarative updates for pods and replica sets. Uh, you describe the set that you want your deployment to be, and then the deployment controller, you know, will change the actual state uh, for that desired state that you want at a control rate. So let me walk you through really quick that deployment YAML. Just like with the namespace, I'm saying, hey, Kubernetes, I want you to create a deployment. I want you to call it as well IMDB. I want this deployment to live in the IMDB namespace. Right, we can add some labels if you choose. These are optional, but we added, you know, a label for uh, name for IMDb. Um, I want you to create one replica of this application, so essentially one pod, and I want you to pull this image. So this image has already been um, uh, pushed into our GitHub container registry. There's so many uh, container registries out there. You can use Docker Hub. Uh, you can use uh, Azure Container Registry. Uh, for this demo, we're using GitHub Container Registry. We figured it was a lot easier to do it, but you can you can do uh, whichever one you want. Um, every time the uh, deployment gets created, you want it to pull a fresh image. We are also passing in some arguments to this application. So we're saying, hey, uh, IMDB app, I want you to run an in-memory database as opposed to running a Cosmos DB database. Uh, and then we're passing in some zone and region. And also we are saying, you know, we want this container to run on uh, port 8080 using the HTTP uh, specification. 
Also, we have some probes to check these, this application is running correctly. You know, we have the readiness probe and we have a liveness probe. And then we define also some uh, resource limits, uh, as you can see here. Okay, so let's get this uh, application deployed. So let, let me go back to the README. So now if I do kubectl apply dash F02. Okay, so the application got deployed. So now I can check that this got deployed by checking the pods, right? So if I do kubectl get pods dash N, N means uh, namespace, INDB. You can see that my application got deployed 15 seconds ago. And I can also check the logs if I want to by doing kubectl logs, and then you're gonna need the pod name, so you can just copy paste. Dash N I N D B. So great, our application is running. It's listening on port 8080. So we should be good to go, right? So our application is running. So let's um, let's call it. Oh, also just to mention this, uh, application, like I mentioned before, we have some port forwards defined. So we have this um, IMDB app running on port um, 30,080. So let's try to hit that endpoint. And as you can see here, we have an error, right? So what's happening? You know, we have our application running, we try to hit the endpoint, but I'm getting this connection error. Um, and this is normal. The reason being that this is not working is because you need actually a, a service. So a service uh, like we defined here is an abstract way to expose an application running on a set of pods as a network service. Uh, there's many ways of defining a service. Uh, you can use a node port, which essentially you're exposing the port of the, uh, of the node in which this application is running, or you can expose a cluster IP or you can do a load balancer. So for this demo, we're using a node port because we want to use the port of the node. So let me show you how this looks like. Um, again, I'm just saying, hey, Kubernetes, I want you to create a service. I want you to call it IMDB in this namespace, right? And I want you to, I know I showed you some labels before, so this labels help us connecting. So I'm saying, hey, I want you to, reference this IMDB app, which is running on port 8080. And I want you to expose it on port 30,080 of my node. So if I go back and if I apply my service, now I can query my application. And by the way, uh, HCCP, it stands for HTTP uh, It's just a REST client. Uh, you can use um, anything really. You can, you can use curl or you can use Postman if you want. Um, for us, it was pretty you know, straightforward to use HTTP for this demo, but you, you know, it's, just, it's just a REST endpoint. So you can use whatever you choose to, to run. So uh, back to this, uh, you can see that I queried the health endpoint. I got back a 200. Um, you know, but the application is, is healthy. So, so that's cool. Uh, now, so if I open this, you can see here like a little link called curl.http. Is uh, This is just an extension for VS Code that allows you to define different endpoints of an application just to do like quick testing. So if I open this curl.http, you can see that we have different endpoints defined. And you're gonna see here like a little gray button called send request. And I just wanted to know this way we can do a little bit of testing. We know we have some some metrics uh, that we're gonna be using later for Prometheus. Um, we can query some actors. You can see we have a list of actors. I think there's one for movies as well. So it's a little slow. Okay, yeah. So as you can see, hey, the application is is, is running. Uh, so we expect it. And going back to port forward, uh, and now if I go back to my ports and if I find IMDB app, you're gonna see here like a little globe icon. So if you click on here, this is when the port forward is gonna, like CodeSpace is gonna port forward that application to the browser. 
and it's connecting to the forward port. It takes, sometimes it takes a little to load, but you will be able to see um, our Swagger docs. I was running this last night and actually it was, it was a little bit slow. I, I, I don't know why. Hopefully we don't have any issues right now. Yep, and if, we'll give it another few seconds and see if it comes up. Yeah, that was having the same issue last night. I'm not sure why. What about you, Tiffany? Were you able to yep, load it? I was. Yeah, you wanna share your screen and I can just talk over really quick? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I don't know. Let me reload the, the code spaces. Um, am I muted? I'm not muted. Um, Joaquin, do you want me to just um, demonstrate really quickly through the Swagger Docs while you take a second to restart your code space? Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah, let's do it. I don't know why it's timing out. I, I was having the same issue last night, so I don't know if it's something related to my GitHub account. So, all right. Thanks, <laughs> yeah, Tiffany. sure. Of course. Um, so, um, hopefully, um, if you're following along with the workshop, you will have been able to open the IMDB Web API. Um, and what you can do is actually test out each of these um, um, CRUD <laughs> commands. Um, and we can uh, click try it out uh, much the same way that you would for any other um, Swagger site. Um, and you can also um, make a query and see the corresponding response. Um, and this is pretty similar to what Joaquin shared in the curl HTTP, but um, in this way, you can see the Swagger UI um, running in your browser. Um, and Joaquin, are you getting spun up still? Um, I'm happy yeah, to- Yeah, actually, I, I, I got it back. Um, and I mean, okay. either way, I was about to transition uh, back to you, Tiffany, but all I wanted to say that, I mean, actually, no, I do need to get it back because I need to delete the applications. Sorry about that. Um, no worries. Yeah, let me, let me, let me share. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So mine, I don't know, started loading, but okay. So now that uh, we um, deployed our application, so let's, um, let's delete it, right? So that way we can um, deploy it again using Flux in a little bit, but now, if you want to delete this application, just like we ran kubectl apply, there's a command called kubectl delete. So um, the first thing I'm gonna delete is uh, the service. So I can just run kubectl delete. I wanna delete the, oh, well, I wanna delete a service that is called IMDB and it's running on the uh, IMDB namespace, okay? Now I can list the pods that you know this application is running on. We have this pod right here, so I'm gonna delete it as well. Delete pod, copy paste, dash n imdb. So great, the pod was deleted, so my application should be gone forever and ever. Well, that's not true. Uh, once you delete the pod, the deployment automatically will detect that and it will bring the, the pod back to it, the state that it's supposed to be. So you can delete this pod made as many times as you want. It's not gonna go away. So if you want to actually be able to delete this application for good, you need to delete the, the deployment. So another way to delete a, a, a Kubernetes resource, uh, you can also do it by the file that you use to deploy it. So in this case, we use the 02 deploy file. So you can just reference that. You can just say kubectl delete dash f02. And there you go. The app is deleted. So if I go back to the pods, you can see that this pod is terminating and now it's gone. Um, so last but not least, we're gonna delete the namespace. So if you remember, if I do kubectl get an S, we have the IMDB namespace. Well, I can always delete it just by running kubectl delete ns IMDB. And it's gone. Just um, give it a second for the finalizers to finish. 
And there you go. Okay, so I just walked you through a super simple, super basic way of deploying an application to Kubernetes. There's a lot more than this, right? This is just like the like the like entry, very basic uh, deployment of an application. Now, what if you have you know more than one application? What if you have fifty applications? And what if you have more than one cluster? What if you have a hundred clusters? Doing this manually, it would just be um, you know it would be very painful. Uh, thankfully, we have Flux, and now. Tiffany is going to show you how we can do uh, different uh, deployments of different applications uh, using Flux. So, Tiffany, it's all yours. Thanks, Joaquin. And I will share my screen. Um, and hopefully, it's okay for all of you watching on YouTube. Um, but exactly right. So. Um, this session, this section of the workshop is going to focus on GitOps with Flux. And what we're going to want to do first is um, create a branch. Um, and basically what this um, uh, branch variable is doing is grabbing your username and appending it with a few random characters so that we don't have collisions. Um, and what we're going to do is switch and create that branch and subsequently push that up. And since we were previously working in the um, um, workshop manifest directory, let's, re let's move back into the base directory of this repository. So I'll continue on um, by describing a few things. Um, and as Joaquin mentioned, um, this code space, uh, which we crafted for this the purposes of this workshop um, includes a K3D cluster, but it also um, installed uh, Flux. And so um, it installed not only the Flux runtime components, but also the Flux CLI, which allows us to use the Flux CLI to run various commands. And we'll be covering a lot of them today, beginning with the Flux check to verify that the Flux runtime components were successfully installed. <clears throat> now, all, even though Flux has been installed in the cluster, we need to um, use Flux Bootstrap so that we can specify the repository and the path within the repository for Flux to read from and reconcile against. And we can do that by um, running a Flux Bootstrap um, git command and we'll uh, pass in the URL of this um, repository as well as the branch which we just exported um, and we're also going to specify token auth. Now this um, and we're also going to pass in the password which is the github token environment variable. Um, this is a, a feature of code spaces so you know at no point do you need to um, worry about uh, passing in a path, um, it will just pick up from your code space. We're also going to specify the path, and I'll go ahead and run this command first, and we can take a look at the um, resulting commits that Flux will make back to the repository. Great. So, uh, Flux does a few things um, as part of the bootstrap git command. Um, and um, one of those things is put commits into the repository that you've specified. And we can take a look at the latest commits put in by Flux by pulling the latest contents of your branch and taking a look at the git log. Um, and here, you can see that there are two commits um, that Flux made, um, one being adding the Flux uh, component manifests, as well as adding the Flux sync manifests. Because we specified the, path, the deploy bootstrap uh, path, the Flux commits um, dropped in the gotkcomponents.yaml 
um, where GOTK stands for GitOps Toolkits components. And this file includes all of the runtime components of Flux. And this is what had been installed into your cluster automatic, uh, well, as part of the uh, starting point for this workshop. The second file that got committed by Flux Bootstrap Git is the GOTK sync YAML. Now this YAML, um, I added some comments in the README, but effectively the sync YAML is comprised of a Git repository and customization pair. And some of these um, uh, things like the branch, as well as the URL. Um, and because we didn't specify a secret ref, Flux <clears throat> automatically creates a secret called Flux system in the Flux system namespace. Um, and this is uh, this allows Flux to um, authenticate and read from your uh, specified repository and branch. This is the Flux customization CRD that I mentioned um, in the introductory part of the session. Um, and as I mentioned, the path is how Flux knows which directory to um, read from and subsequently reconcile against. So effectively, with the um, Git repository and customization pair, the customization's source rest is defined as um, the Flux system, Git repository, defined above. Flux is now monitoring the bootstrap directory of this repository. So then um, we can take a look at all of the resources that have been deployed. Uh, sorry, all of the Flux resources that have been deployed by running a Flux get all command. Now you can pass in um, uh, namespaces to get Flux resources in specific namespaces, but by default, um, it will assume the Flux system namespace, which is where we've deployed these, the Git repository and customization too. Um, in the revision, you'll be able to see that your branch um, is specified as well as the latest commit hash. So that t gives you an indication of the latest um, contents that Flux was able to see from Git. And the uh, and Flux will pull the um, Git repository according to the interval that you set. And in our case, the Git repository interval is set to one minute and the customization is set to 10 minutes. So Joaquin showed us how we could manually deploy resources one by one um, by using the kubectl command. Um, and I say kubectl, not kubectl. <laughs> um, and you can actually take that a step further by creating by using the Flux CLI to create a Flux customization. Now, if you just ran this portion of the command, you would certainly be able to create the customization and deploy it to your cluster. But we wanna make sure that we're adhering to a GitOps workflow. So what we're instead going to do is export the customization that will get created and add it to our uh, deploy bootstrap um, directory in what we'll call the application customization YAML. Great. So if we take a look, we'll see that the application customization YAML has been created. Um, and you might notice this, but don't worry about it. We will um, continue on with the workshop for now um, and see that we're creating a customization in the Flux system namespace named application. Um, the source ref remains the same because we're working in the same Git repository. So if we go back to the readme, um, what we will need to do is add, commit, and push these contents to our branch. And we can subsequently use the Flux CLI to call an automatic, automated reconciliation sorry, automated reconcile on each of our Flux resources. 
and we can do that by running flux reconcile source git. Um, now the source resources um, will be will be um, whoops, specified um, as source. Um, and we can also call recon uh, reconcile on the customization. Great. So that all looks good. Now let's use the Flux CLI to get our customizations. And if you noticed before, we had a depends on block um, defined, which effectively tells Flux to only attempt to reconcile the application customization after the observability customization comes up successfully. So this error actually indicates success. Um, and what we can do is now add a customization uh, for the observability components. And this will be the same process by which we added the application customization. And similarly, we can add commit and push that customization and great. So with all of that committed um, and pushed successfully to our branch, what we can do is call a reconciliation um, for the Flux system customization. Um, and before we had um, called the reconciliation of the source, which is Git, separate to the reconciliation of the customization. But you can do both by specifying with source. And you'll see that first the Git repository will be reconciled and subsequently the Flux system customization. So let's see if I was, aha. So now we see that the Flux system customization and the observability customization have come up successfully and are marked as ready. Now the application one, is reporting as false. If we wait a little while, and usually this happens much more quickly, um, effectively, we could also call a flux reconcile on the customization for the application customization. And because the observability customization has come up successfully, now Flux will be able to reconcile the application customization. So if we now do a get customization, all of our customizations are ready. So this is great, but what does that really mean? And let's take a closer look at the customizations that we've set up. So I mentioned that uh, the customization defines the path. So if we take a look at this uh, deploy observability directory, we can see that there are several folders um, as well as a namespaces YAML. Um, and these are all straight Kubernetes manifests. So as an example, the deployment for Grafana includes several of the Grafana resources, including the deployment, um, all expressed as plain Kubernetes manifests. Um, we're not doing any uh, customized patching or, um, you know, defining any customization overlays um, because the customized controller actually adds that by default for if you're using plain Kubernetes manifests. So, the observability directory includes all of the observability stack that we're going to be using today. And if we similarly look at the application directory, we can see that we've got a heartbeat YAML deployment, an IMDB YAML deployment, which you should remember from um, the manual deployment, um, as well as the web validator heartbeat and the web validator deployment. And these will allow us to um, accomplish some load and integration testing um, at the um, in the observability section of this workshop. So um, 
you can run through each of these commands to take a look at the pods in each of the namespaces that we have just had Flux reconcile on our behalf. Um, and to take a look at everything that we've now got running in the cluster, we can use the same command that um, uh, Joaquin showed us in the beginning to get all of the resources now running in the cluster. And great, we can see all of the resources across all namespaces. Now, let me move down a bit further. Um, so one of the important aspects of GitOps is the ability for these for software agents to detect drift between what's running in your cluster and what's defined in Git or your configuration store. So when Joaquin uh, deleted the pod, we saw that the pod came back because the deployment specified a certain number of replicas um, and Kubernetes brought back the pod. However, when he deleted the deployment, the pod no longer came back. Now that we've got Flux installed um, in our cluster and reading from the required um, directories within our repository, what we can do is go ahead and delete the, deplo uh, delete the deployment in its entirety. Um, and we can see that um, um, we can we can see the progression by throwing a dash dash watch at the end, and we can see that the um, IMDB uh, deployment went from um, deleted to um, one out of one containers being brought back, and this is because Flux is ensuring that what is running in your cluster matches what you've defined in Git. So. We can verify that the pod came back up and great. So Flux also detects drift within the resources that you've defined by Git. So we can take a look at a quick example by taking a look at the deployment and focusing on the number of replicas that we've defined in the IMDB deployment. Um, if you want to, uh, you can specify the editor that you use to um, edit uh, manifests that are running in your cluster by uh, exporting cube editor. Um, and this will allow you to use VS Code as your editor. Um, and we can use the cube cuddle uh, CLI to edit our running IMDB deployment. And if you take a look at the replicas, it's currently set to one, which we expect. And by changing it to two and closing, great. We can see that our deployment was edited. Oops, let me be a little bit quick here. Cool. So immediately after I edited the deployment, the, we can see that the replicas is set to two and there are two available. Um, now, if I oops, throw a watch on the IMDB namespace um, pods, I think I was a little bit too slow, but there might have been a minute or so that there were two pods running um, because what I suspect has happened is, yep, exactly. Flux has reverted back the re replicas in our IMDB deployment to one. Um, and, oops, don't need the watch, but yeah, we can see that there's only one pod running now. So because the sync interval was set to one minute, uh, Flux was quicker than me speaking through a full sentence. So <laughs> um, with that, um, what we've accomplished in this segment is um, we've deployed the observability stack as well as the application following a GitOps workflow using Flux. And I will stop share here and hand back to Joaquin for the uh, final observability segment of this workshop. Thank you, Tiffany. Yeah, let me share my screen really quick. Okay. 
Okay, so um, Tiffany just showed you how to deploy uh, this observability stack and the application stack using um, GitOps. Uh, another way that I like to validate uh, my deployments uh, besides the CLI is using this tool called uh, K9. So K9, it's uh, basically like a UI for the command line, uh, to put it in simple terms. Um, and it's pretty cool. Like it allows you to see all your uh, different Kubernetes resources in a very detailed and organized uh, manner. So if you wanted to run uh, K9s, uh, all you do is just type K9s. And by default, you can see that right now it's listing uh, all the pods uh, for all namespaces. So if you keep scrolling down, you can see that we have a logging namespace running the Fluent Bit pod. We have a monitoring namespace running Grafana. We also have Prometheus as well. So it's a very powerful uh, tool. Now, like for example, if I have, uh, let me go back up a little bit. If I have my WebV heartbeat application, right? Uh, this is an application that essentially is just checking if, oh, the WebV application, it's calling the heartbeat application to make sure that it's it's alive and it's just, you know, doing a query every so often. So if you press L, L uh, it allows you to see the logs for that pod. So if I press L, uh, you can see that there's a request happening um, every five seconds, more or less. Now, if I type uh, escape, I go back. I also have a WebV tool running against my IMDB application. So again, if I press L for logs, uh, this WebV tool is sending um, 10 requests per second to my IMDB application. So pretty cool stuff. Um, the same way, like if I go back, uh, just like I have pods, I can also list different uh, resources like uh, deployments. So I, all I do is I type colon deploy, and you can see all of the deployments that we have. Um, you can do services as well. Uh, you can see here from the services, um, like for example, I don't know, the IMDB app that we talked earlier, you know, and the container is running on port 8080, but this service is exposing it on port uh, 30,080, you know. Or for example, uh, Grafana that we're gonna be talking in a little bit, internally is running on port 3000, but it's exposing it on port 32,000. Same with, uh, with Prometheus, right? Uh, it's running on port 8080 internally, 30,000 externally. So, okay, so back to the observability stack. So the first thing that I wanna talk about is uh, Fluent Bit. Uh, Fluent Bit is a log processor and forward, forwarder that allows you to collect logs, uh, log events from different sources and deliver them to different backends. Um, for this demo, we, instead of using uh, an external backend, we're just forwarding our logs to standard out we figured this would probably be like a really easy way to show you how it works without having to worry about you know connecting to some backend or other different resources. We just wanted to contain everything within the code space. That way, we don't worry about you know connections outside of the code space. So, um, so if you just uh, go back to the pods, uh, do colon pod, and then go all the way down and look for your fluent bit. Um, pod, and if I press L for logs, and then I press W for the toggle wrap, you can see that I have all of my WebV um, application logs being forwarded to standard out. So pretty cool stuff. And you can, um, again, for the purpose of this demo, we already have it like, you know, defined. But if you look into the workshop manifest, oh, sorry, deploy folder, observability, fluent bit. And if you uh, go into the deployment, uh, sorry, the standard out config, 
you can see how this is uh, configured, right? Uh, I'm not gonna jump into too much detail, but um, essentially the way we set it up is to have the logs from the web V application forwarded to Slender out. Um, pretty straightforward. Now, um, the next thing that I wanna show you really quick is uh, Prometheus. So our application, uh, which is the IMDB application is emitting different metrics. Um, and Prometheus uh, is responsible for scraping these metrics and storing them in um, in a database, in a tank series database. So uh, Tiffany already deployed uh, as part of the observability SAC the Prometheus uh, deployment. So uh, an easy way to uh, verify that is you know you can just click on ports, uh, Prometheus, and then click the little globe icon. I already loaded it, like preloaded it from before because I was having some issues, but this is how the uh, Prometheus dashboard looks like. And an easy way to uh, validate the scrape targets, if you go under status targets, oh great, it's hanging up again. I think the demo gods are not on our side today. <laughs> okay, let's see. Uh, Tiffany, was yours able to load as well? <laughs> Let me refresh again. I, I don't know why. It's something with my GitHub account. Uh, it's been happening recently quite a lot. Let me refresh. Sorry about that. Yep. And if you wouldn't mind, oh, I can quickly share uh, my screen. Uh, Let me just try this one more time just in case um, if it works. Yeah, I don't know. Something with my account. Uh, Okay. Yeah, that's yeah Tiffany, right. if you don't mind sharing, um, just to save some time. Yeah, for sure. Sorry about that. Um, and I think, uh, sorry, I was uh, trying to see if there was any questions I could answer um, while you were speaking, um, but hopefully you were, were you able to see Grafana? Uh, yeah, the, the same way. Uh, like it loaded, but once I tried to, it just uh, timing out. But can oh, you please okay. go to Prometheus really quick yes, and then go sure. to status? on the top bar and then targets. Oh, yep. Yeah. How's so um, as you can see here, by default, we have uh, defined some scrape targets. So we are scraping our IMDB service and it has that um, a metrics uh, endpoint. And can you scroll down a little bit, please? keep going all the way down these are like default uh, kubernetes metrics but i just want to show the custom ones uh so there you go so we have the web v application um running as well and uh, yeah so we're running um we're scraping these different metrics as well so now can you go back to the home screen and maybe click on the globe yes thank you so after it's scraping the metrics, you can see that they are showing up uh, here. So we have different um, metrics regarding our application, like you know how long, you know the each request is taking, what's the duration. You know we have some summaries as well. Um, so so that's cool, right? So we have the metrics coming from our application. So the next step that I want to show you is how can I use these metrics to make some and dashboards so for that we're going to have uh, our grafana deployment and the first thing that i would like to show if you click on the little gear icon tiffany please on the left mm. to show the the data sources yep sorry i've got to move left. my zoom i know i've got to move my zoom bar sorry one second <laughs> uh, uh not the other gear icon sorry oh, on the sorry. left Oh, uh, other left. Why did I go to the right? <laughs> yeah, good. And then go to uh, data sources. Oh, we have it there. So uh, right now we have uh, Grafana uh, querying from a Prometheus service that I just showed before. But the only thing that I want to show you is that with Grafana, you can uh, talk to so many uh, backends, right? Like right now we're just using Prometheus as a sample. But you know you can talk to Azure Monitor, Grafana Cloud, Splunk. Like there's so many out there, and you know you can uh, set up these integrations uh, any way you want, as long as there is uh, this you know plugin available to to talk to to that backend. 
So, okay, so back to the dashboards. So in here, you can see that uh, this dashboard is tracking different uh, requests coming into the application. Uh, what's the request uh, per second? Uh, and also what's the duration for these requests? As you can see here as well, we have no errors, which is good. But now what we wanna do is we, we want to break it. So for uh, to do that, we're gonna run um, a load test. We have this tool called Kick, which stands for Kubernetes in Code Spaces. This is an internal tool that we use, um, but it just we just brought it in just so we can run uh, some some load tests really quick. So now Tiffany is uh, running a load test on the background. Sorry. I was gonna kick off the integration test as well, but. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's fine. That's fine. So we're running uh, a load test in the background, but also we're going to run a bunch of integration tests uh, so we can break it on purpose. Right. So um, so right now it's uh, loading. And if we go back to the dashboard. You can see that the request count is starting to go up. Uh, which is pretty cool. You can see that we've ha we're averaging, you know, 18 requests uh, per second, and we're starting to see some errors already, as we expected. So, um, very powerful. Uh, I think Grafana is really cool. That allows you to easily visualize, you know, these things coming from uh, the metrics. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Oh. Um, well, let's see. I yeah, think sorry. that's um, like the only. Oh, I, I had logged into Grafana ahead of time, but. Um, oh, yes. Sorry yeah, about hopefully, that. Yeah, sorry. I should have um, waited. Um, but if you are having any trouble logging into the Grafana dashboard, um, the login details are specified as admin in Kubernetes 101, um, and you can copy that directly from the README. Um, and Tiffany, can you show real quick how uh, it's so easy to export a dashboard on Grafana? Yes. For like sure. just like just show the JSON, or you can yep. show like the 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 yeah. Oh. So yeah, no, that's fine. Actually, that, that's a good idea. Yeah, we can show the dashboard there. So we loaded these dashboards as config maps. Um, so essentially, the Grafana is gonna pick this up and import it automatically by by default. But you can see this as well inside the dashboard. So uh, if you click on the on that gear gear icon, yeah, uh, and then you click on the JSON model, you can see uh, is is there as well. Now um, the last thing I wanted to show is that that it, which is pretty cool. Um, so if you go back to the dashboard and you, you try to edit something, just doesn't matter like the title or whatever. Uh, sorry, like the title a title of the panel. Got it. Um, or just anything really yes. doesn't matter. Yeah. You're uh, going to get this message because Grafana is detecting that this dashboard was provisioned using the config map. So you cannot um, edit it manually uh, or you cannot save it actually which is kind of cool because it's forcing you to store your source of truth in uh, GitHub as part of uh, GitHub. So if you want to do this, you're going to have to store it uh, as a commit in GitHub to, to update it. So pretty interesting stuff. And let me refresh, reload. Um, because we defined the dashboard in Git, um, by me manually changing the title of this pane, um, Flux noticed the drift and uh, forced it to um, match what we defined as our desired state, which includes the definition of our Grafana dashboard. Sorry, um, <laughs> just wanted to yeah. add that. No, no, thank you. Um, so yeah, so that's that concludes the um, workshop portion of the Go through the session. So I guess Tiffany, do you want to bring back the the slides? Yes, please. Thank you. Yep. And if I you give me just one second, I will head into presenter mode. 
and I will reshare. Um, awesome. So um, for those of you who followed along, um, I hope you were able to um, run through all of the commands. And for those of you who wanted to have a listen and you know have a play with the workshop on your own time um, following this workshop, um, the um, I think that we'll be leaving the um, organization and the repos available for the uh, coming few weeks following GitOps days. Um, and yeah, hope you have um, a chance to create a code space, take a look at it, and also run through the commands. Um, and today we've covered quite a bit of material um, in a... Um, comparatively compact amount of time, um, but we've covered Kubernetes and we've um, used and deployed Kubernetes resources to a K3D cluster in our GitHub code space. Um, and we've also used Flux uh, to deploy the sample IMDV application, as well as the observability stack, all following GitOps principles. And we also um, used observability to monitor the sample application metrics and we simulated application use and traffic um, and it's successfully served and failed um, uh, traffic requests um, via the integration and load tests. Um, so um, we have some time dedicated to Q&A um, and one thing that I think um, I'll double check with um, with with uh, the GitOps Days coordinators um, is uh, we'll make these slides available um, in case you want to refer back to them um, and yeah you should have access to your code spaces um, for the next few weeks and I um, would also mention that. Um, once you're done using your code space, uh, sorry, one second. Um, what you can do is you can actually delete your code spaces by managing um, the code space and you can click delete when you're ready to do so. Um, and that will help us, you know, make sure that there's um, um, no code spaces that are going unused, um, but, and that'll help us, um, you know, uh, hopefully that will allow us to have code spaces for the next session that we might do in the future. So um, yeah, thanks very much for joining everybody. And um, Tamao, do you have some questions for us? Yes, um, so thank you so much for this. And let's remind everybody that this was a tutorial that um, was accepted and you presented at um, KubeCon EU. Uh, so, you know, this is really a special treat. We're really um, thankful that um, uh, Microsoft has um, allowed us to have um, these um, this access during this tutorial. So I thought I'd, um, I'll monitor the Slack, so please let us know if you have any questions. Uh, I also put in the Slack if you have any feedback for the future. This is something that we would um, love to do again. It is something that has to be live if um, you want to take advantage of the um, available environment, um, but people can do it on their own. I guess you just have to make sure that you have um, the right account access to, um, uh, you know, have access to, to code spaces. Um, so one thing I thought um, we'd mention is, so uh, you've posted, I think on Slack, the link to the um, tutorial on GitHub, if people wanna follow along. Uh, it's been around since um, before KubeCon and inspired us to do this. Um, secondly, um, I just wanted to make sure, so uh, people would have their own account, they would follow along, but if we could do a workshop again, um, we'd have a similar kind of thing where um, Joaquin provided the credentials. Um, and then, yeah, let us know, because we'd, we'd love to do it again. We'd love to hear um, if this is very helpful. Um, but otherwise, uh, we will. this is recorded. And so for people following along with the recording, the only thing that would be different is that the, you know, the free access during the 90 minutes. Um, so I see a question, so I'll follow the questions, but I also thought as we wrap up, it might be good to kind of go through the questions that came up during it so that when people are um, 
following along if they want to on the recording, they can um, see if they have the same issues. Um, yeah. So we had one question, which was um, for app and observability deployment. Um, there's no issue so far, except that the Git redirection 504 timeout error came up when I load the uh, IMDB or Prometheus page. Um, do you have help yeah. that you can provide in the moment? I think that um, is that what you also ran into, Joaquin. Um, sometimes yeah, it can it, be resolved with a refresh um, yeah. of the um, page in your browser, you know, whether it's Prometheus or Grafana. Um, but you can also, you know, um, stop and restart the code space. Sometimes um, that helps. Um, and we can also uh, follow up and perhaps add some more resources to the last page of the deck. Um, I, I, we're in the Q&A session, I think that's clear. Um, I wanted to just quickly uh, mention that you can reach Joaquin and myself um, via email or um, find us on Twitter. Um, and we also have a list of resources. Um, you might have seen some familiar diagrams, um, you know, a lot of familiar content. Um, and we've collated a list of resources and we can certainly add some additional resources for, you know, tips and tricks for code space troubleshooting as well. Excellent. Um, and I, I noticed again, to recap some of the questions, there were some questions about uh, Grafana login. So I guess yep. that's specific to this workshop or is that something that people can do when they're on their own later? Ah, so this is, um, it'll be the same credentials for the initial login for um, Grafana. So that's included in the README. Um, now the admin password, um, you, you can um, change the secret, uh, the, sorry, you can change the password, um, but in order for that to get picked up, um, you can uh, recreate the code space. Um, and the reason for this is because the um, effectively seed uh, credentials are um, added to the uh, SQLite database underneath. Um, and that won't get changed um, unless you recreate your code space. Um, but you can um, also change the password if you wanted um, by going to Grafana um, and um, clicking the change password um, icon and doing it from there. But otherwise, um, this is part of the um, Grafana deployment. So if you take a look at the deployment YAML where we define the secret, which is um, a not so secret secret for the purposes of the workshop intentionally, um, this is simply base64 encoded as all uh, generic Kubernetes secrets are. Um, so I wonder if that was a, a bit of a long-winded answer to a simple question, uh, which might have just been, where are the login credentials? <laughs> <laughs> it's good to know. It's good to know what's going on. Um, and then uh, a flux question, whether it was addressed or not, um, a general flux question, I think is good to um, address. I was just talking about it with Kingdon the other day. Um, so uh, as unless Flux is new to you or if you were hearing um, Tiffany's explanation, um, so Flux will regularly reconcile. Um, and so there's a question kind of about the time period. So uh, I think the default is one minute based on how it's set up with customize, but someone is asking, um, can I make that even shorter to like, <laughs> it seems like under a second, I'm not sure, but um, uh, yeah, how, how do, <laughs> that seems pretty, um, that seems like a lot, but uh, yeah. but I guess a general question is um, how would one customize the duration? That's a good question, just in Absolutely. general for Flux users. For sure, um, and I don't know if I'm the I know if you can do a sub second uh, uh, sync interval, um, but basically, at each uh, Flux um, custom resource. That is um, any resource whose API version effectively includes Flux CD. Um, there will be an interval um, under the uh, resources spec, and you can specify the interval there. So, um, yeah, and there um, is one caveat, which is the um, 
uh, GOTK sync YAML that is generated by Flux. Um, and that's where the uh, Flux's, sorry, the Flux system customization is set to 10 minutes. Um, and I actually don't know, but there, you might have a, um, you might be able to pass in a specified interval to the bootstrap command. Yeah. Ah, and Kingdon is answering more yeah. eloquently than I. <laughs> uh, yeah, Kingdon, as many of you might know in the Flux community, is also um, um, helping us out in uh, Slack. And um, I'm also just curious what the use case would be for a sub second uh, need. Um, and that's a good segue as we wrap up this section to remind people um, that Kingdon on our team has also been working on um, uh, having an extension uh, for Flux, a Flux extension for VS Code, which uh, you're able to see um, using VS Code here. So it's very exciting. I know a lot of people, we've been kind of asking around uh, what IDs people are using, um, Goland, um, some Emacs, um, but it seems like top of the list uh, from at least the the early survey that we've done is a lot of people are using VS Code. So um, hopefully if you are already a Flux user and already a VS Code user, um, this extension will be useful for you. Um, and Kingdon will be talking about that uh, later today in GitOps Days. So if you're interested to learn more about that, um, we have uh, just pushed a pre-release version into the VS Code uh, extensions marketplace. Uh, so uh, again, very, very alpha. So please don't give us bad stars, um, but uh, do uh, let us know what you think, uh, post issues. And yes, we're actively working on this and we'll um, make a little bit noise once we're like in the final release. So again, thanks everybody for joining us. It's really fun to watch everybody on YouTube um, and in Slack engaging with us and hopefully following along. Um, if you did have challenges following along, um, yeah, please let us know where is this, everything is evolving. And uh, I do know that Tiffany and Joaquin have other workshops in this area that you've been putting together. So yeah, if you love this idea of using code spaces, um, to do intros, to you know, maybe in the future do more advanced things around GitOps, progressive delivery, Kubernetes, um, other areas. Um, it's just a really, um, I'm excited about the platform. They haven't paid me, by the way. <laughs> I just, I was literally in Joaquin reached out. I was very excited because um, in my early days at WeaveWorks, um, we ran workshops. Recording Tiffany, in progress. Where Tiffany was um, one of our participants way back in the day. And it was very painful to have to deal with everybody having different um, laptops and different operating systems and, you know, things go wrong and you feel like you're spending half the time troubleshooting that stuff and instead of actually teaching the material. So it's been really great to uh, see this recording working stopped and uh, let us know. So uh, with that, thank you so much, uh, Tiffany and Joaquin. Uh, we are going to take a break uh, again with uh, DJ Desired State. Um, at the top of the hour, I'll be returning with my trusted co-MC, uh, Vanessa, um, who will help us kick off some fantastic keynotes, including, um, I think, a friend to some of you, uh, Taylor Dolezal of the CNCF. Hey, Vanessa! <laughs> um, and, um, you know, talking about uh, GitOps in the CNCF landscape, as I'm sure Tiffany and Joaquin have experience now we've been saying is a natural evolution of kubernetes um, hopefully this workshop has shown a little bit i think people who are brand new will say like oh flux is doing x y and z and a lot of times the answer is well it's flux and kubernetes doing different parts as well as other tools right um, contributing to this GitOps experience um, so uh, taylor dolezal um, and then um philippe uh um, sorry okay, you want to get the pronunciation Absolutely. correct from um, orange <laughs> Um, and May Large from VMware, um, as well as many, many other speakers will be following us. So um, join us for that. And so with that, I think we'll have DJ Desired still getting started. Tiffany, Joaquin, thank you. Vanessa, thank you are you much. excited to get our music going here? I have had the best time watching the demos and workshop. I'm so excited to get into the music. Let's go, Daniel.